Um, thank you very much for coming. This is the, the second in our series of Marblehead 101, um, which is our new plan for the next three years of Mar uh, Marblehead history. So we're starting at the beginning, and um, so last week we had Native Americans, and this evening we have um, a colonial American uh, topic. And uh, I, I hopefully you'll, uh, and the exhibit downstairs, and ho hopefully you'll be able to join us afterwards for a chance to look at the exhibit. Um, but um, the Marblehead Museum is, as I say, delighted to have you all here this evening. And we're very pleased to be able to welcome Lauren Fogel, who is uh, a historian. Um, she te she's a professor at the University of uh, Massachusetts at Lowell. And um, she asked me to tell you that her specialty is not colonial uh, America, but in fact is uh, medieval history. But um, while that's her disclaimer, I would say that, um, and you may be familiar with her book, um, Colonial Marblehead, which we have for sale downstairs. Um, and she certainly has done an admirable job of, of researching um, the history of Marblehead. I do like to put that disclaimer on there, because I think it's smart. Okay, great distemper. Okay, let's see if our newfangled new item works. It does. Now you think Alexander the Great? How can this? Be? Um, good lord, can't see much. Okay. Yes, he was from Marblehead. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I will. Uh, I will get to him in due course. So um, what I'm going to do is I uh, will do the lecture, and then maybe we can all talk about things afterwards. Um, so, little did I know, as I sprinted happily around Children's Island as a youngster, archery, swimming, that I was actually enjoying summer camp on the site of a former smallpox inoculation hospital. In fact, it wasn't until I began this research for my Colonial Marblehead book a few years ago that I learned the true history of smallpox and Marblehead. I didn't, I didn't know any of it, actually. To better understand what happened in Marblehead, let me first say a few things about the history of smallpox in general so we get a context. We think smallpox originated in the ancient world. We know that Egyptian mummies from the 18th to 20th dynasties, that is roughly uh, 1570 to up to close to 1000 BC, um, bear facial marks that are thought to be the ravages of smallpox. The disease was also mentioned in ancient Sanskrit and Chinese texts, so it was evident in those, in those civilizations as well. Alexander the Great, his armies were ravaged by a rash that was most likely smallpox as they attempted to invade India in the middle of the uh, 4th century BC, uh, they retreated because, in some part, because of smallpox. Um, in the second century AD, a smallpox epidemic known as the Antonine Plague um, killed as many as 5 million inhabitants of the Roman Empire. That is a pit, a plague pit of um, where they threw the, the bodies, and of course, you can see there that in, you know, a group of archaeologists had gotten in there and was labeling everything. Um, the, the plague was brought to Rome by the legions returning from various campaigns in the east where they picked it up and brought it into Rome. Uh, due to the symptoms which included fever, skin eruptions, most historians believe that this outbreak was smallpox. Uh, there have been some who suggested it was measles and for a long time measles and th smallpox were thought to be the same thing. That we know they're not now and they eventually did figure that out. But even if a historian of the time, of a contemporary historian to the Antonine Plague said measles, that doesn't mean it was measles. It means that they thought there were different words for the same thing. Um, it was called the Antonine Plague because amongst its victims was the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antonius. So they named it for him. <coughs> Obviously, after the breakup of the Western Roman Empire, the disease would have spread widely through all the barbarian tribes, uh, effectively placing it in uh, all the corners of Europe by the Middle Ages. And if that wasn't enough, the uh, Christian knights were exposed to smallpox when they fought uh, the Islamic forces during the Crusades. So it was definitely um, flowing through Europe in the med medieval period. Um, by now, most people recognized that smallpox, or sorry, that people who survived smallpox were immune to it afterwards. They figured that out. They also knew that smallpox is highly contagious and usually presented with fever, symptoms, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, the appearance of red skin spots or lesions, later known as pox. And they usually spelled that P-O-C-K-E-S, or 
P-O-C-K-S. Um, on the face, hands, arms, torso. For the survivors, the rash often left a very significant scarring, which is where we get the term pockmarks from. Um, what they didn't know was that smallpox was most infectious after the spots appeared, but less so in the later stages as the scabs began to fall off. Um, the death rates varied from 20% to 60%, but for infants were almost 90%. An infant under the age of about five. You know, infant was a word that they used. They, we use it as a smaller baby now. It was actually a word that encompassed small children. So it was a very high rate for them. Um, the disease was sometimes called variola, which comes from the Latin, which is varus, meaning mark on the skin. The English later called it smallpox to distinguish it from syphilis, because syphilis was called great pox. So it's great pox and smallpox. Um, let's see what I've got next. Oh, there it is. That was the nicest picture I could find to put on there of a man with smallpox. Some of, the, some of the images are so graphic, I just decided against it. Um, as the Europeans gradually became more immune to outbreaks of smallpox, they brought it with them to North and South America in the 16th century. And the disease decimated the native Inca and Aztec populations as well as the tribes of North America as well. Um, and I got a couple of images, not necessarily completely contemporary, but showing at least the right kind of idea here. Uh, I think those were actually supposed to be Northern Native Americans, and these are supposed to be Southern American, Native Americans, South Americans. Um, that one is, uh, is, is uh, obvious, what's going on there, because you can see the, 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 the lesions. Um, this is how Governor Bradford of Plymouth described the Native American tribes dying of smallpox. I'm, I'm sorry if this is graphic, and if anyone you know, feels a little weird, just let me know. Um, quote, they fell sick of ye smallpox and died most miserably for a sore disease cannot befall them. They fear it more than the plague, for usually they have this disease, they have them in abundance. I think that means the pustules, the, 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 the actual pox. And for want of bedding and lining, or linen, and other helps, they fall into a lamentable condition. As they lie on their hard mats, ye pox breaking and mattering and running into one another, their skin cleaving to the mats that they lie on, when they turn them, a whole side will flee at once. They will be all of gore blood, and they die like rotten sheep. I think you get the point. Um, it's a very bad disease to die of. It's a very painful disease, and it sometimes can last a long time. Uh, smallpox was also endemic during this period in Africa, and African slaves reaching the Caribbean and North and South American continents brought new smallpox outbreaks throughout the 16th to 18th centuries. Samuel Sewell, whose journal we rely on so heavily for the information about the Salem witch trials, also betrayed the constant terror of the population of Massachusetts Bay Colony with regards to smallpox and their desperate attempts to curb its spread. Already by the 17th century, there were a number of theories about how to treat and prevent smallpox, some of them medieval theories, including one that insisted the patient be left naked in a cold room with the windows open and be given beer constantly. <laughs> Eventually, the idea of inoculation or variolation, those are interchangeable terms, emerged. People would take the flesh from a pustule on a person with smallpox and transfer that into an open wound on a healthy person. The person would then contract a mild form of the disease and usually survive it and be immune to it afterwards. But there were risks. There were fears that the patient could get a full-blown variant of the disease and die or spread it to other people. There was the fear of catching syphilis, or another blood-borne disease from the smallpox pustule. Despite the risks, this was practiced in places like Istanbul, India, China, long before the 18th century, when it was introduced to Europe and the Americas. The doubt and the fear was intense, despite the fact that some kings and queens and aristocrats like um, Frederick of Prussia, um, Catherine II of Russia, Empress Maria Theresa of Austria, people like that, uh, had their children publicly inoculated in order to show the benefits. Still didn't, didn't quite satisfy everybody. Inoculation was practiced on prisoners, orphans, and usually had a good result in a low death rate. On our side of the pond, it was the collaboration of Cotton Mather and Dr. 
Zabdiel Boylston that brought inoculation to the masses. The smallpox epidemic in Boston in 1721, which infected nearly 6,000 people and killed just under 850, which is approximately 77 deaths per 1,000, um, uh, was, very, was very significant, and people were very concerned about it, obviously. Um, to make a comparison, this was about eight times as many people that died in the 1918 influenza outbreak. So the, in the influenza outbreak, you're looking at eight to nine people per thousand that's dying. Okay. Um, in, in smallpox, it was um, 77. So it was a very significant outbreak. Um, so this was serious enough to warrant an inoculation program. But few besides Mather and Boylston were convinced of its safety or efficacy. Eventually, the idea caught on once statistical analysis showed that the death rate for naturally occurring smallpox in Boston was 14%, and yet only 2% for inoculated patients. Um, a Boston lawyer by the name of John Adams, whose great uncle was Zabdiel Boylston, was himself inoculated in 1764 and wrote this to his fiancée, Abigail, during his quarantine. Quote, do not conclude from anything I have written that I think inoculation a light matter. A long and total abstinence from everything in nature that has any taste. Two long heavy vomits. One heavy cathartic. Four and twenty mercurial and antimonial pills. And three weeks of close confinement to a house are, according to my estimation, no small matters. Despite this rather less than ringing endorsement, Abigail Adams did herself uh, have herself and her children inoculated in 1775 while her husband was in Paris drumming up support for the Continental Army. Um, did anyone see that HBO miniseries on John Adams? Yes. Wasn't that good? Yeah. But apparently this was actually not quite correct in this case. Um, there's a disturbing and memorable scene when Abigail and her children undergo inoculation via the infected flesh of a dying boy who's basically brought by their house on a cart. Unfortunately, this was artistic license. They were actually inoculated by a physician in Boston or with other members of her family. Still, I thought it worked. Nevertheless, I think the scene you know, brought home the, the difficult decisions families face during outbreaks of smallpox. So it's this general context that we come to understand the events in Marblehead. During the 1721 <laughs> smallpox outbreak, the Marbleheaders declared that there would be no inoculations in their town. In fact, they refused to admit any inoculated person into the town. Because of this, the Reverend Edward Holyoke of the Second Church <coughs> left Marblehead to be inoculated in Boston, and he stayed for a while at Cotton Mather's house. The outbreak in 1721 was fairly minor in Marblehead, but a more serious outbreak occurred sev several years later in 1730. The townspeople felt that smallpox had been brought to them via ship, and they were probably right about that. And since cutting off of all the shipping would devastate the town's economy, they took other measures. I think I have actually just a sort of colonial marblehead picture to just show you. There you go. We'll leave that up for a while. Um, so they built a fence at the entrance to the town and assigned men to patrol it. There was a 9 o'clock curfew at night, and they shot any of the feral or homeless dogs that were roaming around. They discontinued the ferry to Salem, and they isolated the infected persons uh, within their homes. That's, that's what they did first. The intensity of the 1730 outbreak turned Marbleheaders against inoculation despite the fact that it was gaining acceptance in many other places, like Boston. They simply felt that if the inoculated person wasn't properly isolated, that person could transmit smallpox to others. While this was technically possible, it happened very rarely. The first real riot that occurred in Marblehead during the smallpox epidemic was in December of 1730 when a mob of over 200 fishermen and others gathered at the house of the Justice of the Peace, Stephen, now his, I don't know how to pronounce his name. His name is spelled M-I-N-O-T. Minot. Not Minot. He wouldn't have done it the French way. Yeah. Minot. We're going with Minot. Okay, I'm going with Minot. 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 See, I never, I never knew how to pronounce that. Okay, this is excellent. I've learned something. All right, Justice of the Peace, Stephen Minot, and threatened to pull his house down. Um, that was what it actually says in the records. I'm going to pull, pull this house down. They were angry because there had been a rumor circulating that Minot had plans to inoculate his family. Minot and the Marblehead Sheriff attempted to calm the men down, wrote down as many of their names as they could, until eventually the mob meandered over towards the old townhouse and sort of gathered outside that. Minot's house was soon threatened again by a new crowd, most wielding bats or sticks, 
And it was at this point that Minot decided to call in the militia. Unfortunately for him, the leaders of the militia were outside his house waving bats and sticks. <laughs> Minot had managed to take a few of them inside his house, um, and they were referred to as prisoners, which leads me to assume that Minot and or the sheriff or both had a firearm on them, trained on them. Otherwise, I'm not sure how they would have been kept prisoner. Um, eventually, it was negotiated that the prisoners would be transferred to the house of the local constable. And the crowd outside slowly dispersed, and it seemed as if all would be well. Until the next day, when a group of about 50 fishermen stormed the constable's house, released the prisoners, and left the constable himself unconscious. <coughs> of all the people involved in this riot, only three were ever successfully prosecuted in the Essex County Courts, despite the fact that one of the presiding judges was Stephen Minot. These men never served jail time, but were only required to pay their court costs. This slap on the wrist indicated just how much support the rioters had from the Marblehead population as a whole. Everyone seemed to fear inoculation and distrusted anyone who claimed to be in favor of it. But it wasn't quite that simple. Of the Marbleheaders who favored inoculation, most were wealthy, elites, and relative newcomers to, to town, not a part of the original settling group. The, these newcomers were almost always members of the second church and had long been distrusted by the older established families who attended the first church. However, it wasn't primarily first church members who were inciting the riot. It was the members of St. Michael's, the Anglican church. <laughs> Nothing's changed, just kidding. Um, the Anglicans were frequently involved in outbreaks of violence in colonial Marblehead. But this, it's documented, but in this case, uh, they were actually trying, probably trying to establish their solidarity with all Marbleheaders and their opposition to inoculation, in this case. They had long been the scapegoat for various problems and were in some ways considered outsiders by the first and second church members due to their ties to the Church of England. It's not hard to understand. After the riot, the town elected three uh, Anglicans to three of the five open selectmen seats after the riot. So their public display of solidarity worked. Now, the 1730 riot really, really pales in comparison to the events surrounding the next major outbreak of smallpox in Marblehead in 1773. This time, in addition to the usual precautions of fence erecting and dog shooting, they moved most of the infected people to the area near where the Salem Ferry launched on the Salem side um, and cared for them in special sort of almshouse hospitals. And uh, the seaman slash adventurer Ashley Bowen, who kept that fascinating journal, was quite obsessed with smallpox and noted in his journal when people died, quote, at ferry. That became synonymous with dying. And sometimes in his journal, he doesn't even say they died. He just says, you know, five more at ferry, which means five people have gone to ferry and are not coming back. So it, it, that's what it meant. Um, the town selectmen frequently published notes in the Essex Gazette declaring that Marblehead was safe for business and that the smallpox cases were minor and contained. And I have a little thing of that that I'll just read you real quick from my book. The selectmen of Marblehead hereby notified the public that the smallpox is in but one house in the town, which is a quarter of a mile below the market house, that the old townhouse is the market house, and close to the waterside, and in two houses at the ferry, one mile from the market house. No other place in town being infected with that distemper, a committee of inspection daily examining every house in town. Travelers and market men may come as usual and be in no danger of infection at present. Uh, the truth was probably closer to Bowen's constant remarks about deaths, funerals, and new infections. Enter John and Jonathan Glover, Azer Orne, and Eldridge Gurry. Uh, who proposed that the town build an inoculation hospital on Cat Island, which is now known as Children's Island. The town, that's an Ashley Bowen drawing right there, by the way, it's from his journal. The town decided against the proposal, but suggested that the men build it themselves as a private enterprise. So they did. They called it the Essex Hospital, and they encouraged people to sign up for inoculation there in October of 1773. The hospital had 10 rooms, which could accommodate eight patients each. They hired guards to prevent anyone from leaving the island too soon or coming onto the island without permission. All patients would have their clothes washed and fumigated when they arrived and would wear an extra set while on the island. And they were usually, they were supposed to be there about 30 days. Most of them weren't there quite that long. Boatmen would ferry patients back and forth 
from the island but would never actually set on foot the island themselves under penalty of dismissal. Dr. Hall Jackson, a relatively well-known physician, was brought down from Portsmouth to preside over the facility when it opened, and 103 people were immediately inoculated with no reported deaths. Now, that's more than what they said that they could handle. They had 10 rooms with eight beds, so, or eight people to a room, so obviously they've got, they're, they're really pushing them in there. It must have been pretty crowded. Despite this obvious success, many townspeople of Marble had feared the hospital and felt it was a threat. Ashley Bowen referred to it as Castle Pox and part of the island as Cape Puss. <laughs> he called Dr. Jackson the general. Uh, Andrew uh, Wehrman published an article on smallpox in Marblehead in uh, New England Quarterly in 2009, and he wrote that Ashley Bowen likely felt that, quote, the inoculations threatened the community like an unwanted military occupation. They, uh, they watched the people, they watched the people on the island, the patients, perhaps from boats, uh, saw them playing games and, quote, quote, exposing themselves to all, to open air in all weathers. And I wondered if, could this mean they're still doing that cold medieval treatment? You know, everybody has to be cold all the time? I don't know what that means exactly, but it, it could be that some of those treatments were still being used. Bowen even remarked that the patients enjoyed bonfire night, which was uh, the end of Pope's Day, the colonial version of Guy Fawkes Day, but with a very anti-papist sort of slant. I think I put a slide of that in there too. Um, the one with the hat is the Pope. Yeah. Uh, they did that in Boston a lot, but they also did it in Marblehead and um, had big bonfires and so he, he saw them out there all dancing around the bonfire on the island. Even though the inoculations were succeeding, some Marbleheaders looked for any excuse to bring the hospital down. Part of their hostility might have been due to the fact that the price set for inoculation at the hospital was five pounds and 15 shillings. Out of reach for mo all but the most well-off in Essex County and was in fact the most expensive fee of all the inoculation hospitals in the colonies. Our own Cat Island. Um, of course, these days, eight dollars for a 30-day hospital stay sounds like a bargain. <laughs> but that was, um, one, only one of the problems with inoculation. It was viewed as a tool of the rich only. When a physician called Ibrahim Mustafa, personal inoculator to the Turkish Sultan, ran an ad in the Essex Gazette in 1773 showcasing his painless smallpox inoculation treatments, he addressed himself to, quote, the nobility and gentry of this city, which was Salem. He didn't bother with anyone else. Just about this time, an article was published in the Essex Gazette by a Scottish physician who decried the elitist view of many inoculation hospitals and insisted that women had been the main inoculators in Turkey and there was no need for fancy doctors or hospitals. So after the opening of the Essex Hospital, Salem opened their own inoculation hospital but kept it under town ownership and charged about half what the Essex Hospital was charging. The Marbleheaders, who were given no priority as patients at the hospital, by the way, made very strict rules about when and where the patient transport boats could land on the mainland. When it was suspected that the hospital was releasing patients too early, the regulations were tightened and the patient boats were to only land in isolated spots like Peaches Point. But since the town had forgone ownership of the hospital, they had little legal rights over the hospital's operations and policies. So, when several patient boats landed at non-approved landing spots in Marblehead, there was little the Marbleheaders could do legally, so they burned the boats. <laughs> Individual patients were also targeted, like a gentleman who had negotiated the early release of his wife and child from the hospital. His house was surrounded by a mob with blackened faces and liquor in their bellies who threatened him with hanging and boiling in oil. The house they had surrounded was empty since the gentleman and his family had fled the town the night before. But still. Soon after, the main patient ship, which was called the Mercury, was also burned. Somehow, four men made it out to the island and stole some clothes from the hospital. These clothes had been washed, fumigated, and were drying on lines outside the hospital, but it had been left behind by patients who were in a rush to leave the hospital and reach the safety of their own homes, <coughs> which are often in Portsmouth, in places sort of north of, of Marblehead. Um, of the four men, two of them had recently been inoculated on the island themselves, so they perhaps were retrieving their own clothes. The other two were thieves, bent on stealing the abandoned clothes. Regardless, 
they were discovered by Azor Orn and his men, and they were brought back to Marblehead. The townspeople were outraged, since the clothes, they felt the clothes could bring the disease to the town. And so they tarred and feathered the men. The next morning, they took them from their homes again and tarred them and feathered them a second time. <laughs> and pulled them in a cart to Salem. Um, and it's actually hilarious because there is an, an advertisement in the Salem, uh, sorry, in the Essex Gazette just right before this event that says, looking for a quantity of feathers and an old cart. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just thinking, is that for that thing? Are they about to use those feathers? Okay, I think they are, I'm pretty sure. Um, so being tarred and feathered, one would be, I imagine, quite, it'd be quite unpleasant, but twice in two days, was, as the Essex Gazette put it, quote, the most extraordinary exhibition of the kind ever seen in North America. <laughs> Both these men were near death after the incident, and these were not the only people tarred and feathered for an offense regarding the hospital. It happened at another time, too. So, as tempers flared, the town insisted on sending inspectors to the hospitals to submit full reports on what was happening there. Soon afterwards, over 20 new cases of smallpox were reported in Marblehead and pretty much everyone pointed their fingers at the hospital. The proprietors relented and closed the hospital, despite the fact that they knew, uh, or they in no way suspected the hospital was to blame for the new infections. Well, most people refused to believe that the hospital was indeed closed. And so a group of men went out there one night and they burned the whole thing down. Unfortunately, they failed to remember that the inspectors and their families were still inside the hospital sleeping. Why the, why the inspectors brought their families, I have no idea, but they did. Um, no one died, but women and infants were forced to flee into the freezing January night in their underclothes. The proprietors had lost 2,000 pounds, which is a huge sum in 1720, uh, 1774. News spread fast that many, and many local communities were aware that smallpox and inoculation was br were bringing Marblehead to the breaking point. Again. Only two men, and there were reportedly over 20 involved, were ever arrested in relation to the act of arson. They were incarcerated in the Salem jail until February 25th, when a mob of four to 500 Marbleheaders, mainly fishermen, marched to Salem, armed with clubs, axes, crowbars, and the like, uh, stormed the Salem jail, and escorted the accused men back to Marblehead. The sheriff of Salem, despite having been beaten rather badly, in the assault, gathered his own equally large group and marched to Marblehead two days later to retrieve the prisoners. <laughs> they were met by an even larger group of, Mar of Marbleheaders and it was fairly clear that a battle was brewing when the hospital proprietors finally intervened and agreed to drop the suit against the accused men. And that's what dissipated the, the almost war. Just when everyone thought the worst was over and Ashley Bowen even wrote in his journal, and I quote, Fini for the Isle of Cat. I love this guy. Um, one, of the, one of the very same men who was tarred and feathered for stealing clothes from the hospital previously returned to Cat Island and stole more clothes, most of which were charred ruins by this point. His name was John Clark. His motive is unknown, though he must have been quite desperate to attempt such a thing, attempt such a thing after all that had occurred. When he discovered uh, when he was discovered with the clothes, he was surrounded by a menacing crowd who felt it was their duty and right to punish him themselves. He was initially saved by the selectmen who insisted he would be punished in due course. But that was not enough for the townspeople who were raw with anger and fear. They took him from his house that night, tied him to the whipping post and beat him badly. He later forged, uh, lodged a formal complaint, but as usual, only one person was ever arrested and imprisoned for the beating. Not long after these events in Marblehead, Marblehead and the colonies were plunged into war with the British. The British had been inoculating their soldiers against smallpox since the French and Indian War, and the Continental Army decided to do the same. When another outbreak hit Marblehead in 1777, the fences went up, the dogs were shot, but Dr. Hall Jackson was also brought back to town. He successfully inoculated 450 people, and there were no reports of violence or protest in the town. Even Ashley Bowen had his four children inoculated and worked as a ship cleaner during the war and scrubbed vinegar onto the decks of ships con contaminated with smallpox. Bowen was also installed at the watch house and was in charge with smoking any new arrivals in town. A sulfur-based smoke was thought to decontaminate them. Those being smoked stuck their heads out a hole in the wall to avoid succumbing to smoke inhalation. 
Nothing like sending 40% of your town's male population off to war to even out the perspective. What stands out now, years after the events, is just how much the smallpox conflicts mirrored the larger conflicts of the revolution, the small against the mighty, the ordinary against the royal. Andrew Wehrman wrote, quote, in his article on this, quote, in the minds of the ordinary people of Marblehead, Castle Pox and its overseers embodied a tyranny no less dangerous and more immediate than posed by the king and parliament. <coughs> The hospital's proprietors chose instead to blame a few ringleaders for poisoning the whole town against the hospital. And Gary and John Glover both withdrew from the town's committee of correspondence due to the fervor over the hospital. These men, despite their significant contributions after these events, felt that inoculating the whole town would have brought the economy to a standstill, but insisted they would attempt to provide for the inoculation of some poorer townspeople. In the end, only 15 people were ever inoculated via charity of the proprietors, and that, that just wasn't enough for the townspeople. In the late 1790s, Ed, uh, British physician Edward Jenner is, um, discovered that inoculating a person with cowpox, which is just another version of pox, but it, it's like less virulent, could actually make them immune from smallpox. The Latin for cow is vaca, hence the term vaccine vaccination. Smallpox vaccines were first administered in Massachusetts in 1800, and Massachusetts was the first state to require the vaccination of all school children. I think the actual first vac vaccination in the whole country was in, is in Boston. A new book that I just found called Pox in American History by Michael Woolrich chronicles the turn of the century battles between governmental forces trying to stamp out the latest smallpox epidemic with forced vaccination programs and quarantines, and the anti-vaccination groups who felt that their hard-won civil liberties were being infringed upon. This very conflict still exists today, perhaps not with smallpox, but with other vaccines, like the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. As a historian, I've always had a hard time with the anti-vaccine movement, and here's why. Despite this conflict, by 1840, smallpox vaccination replaced inoculation and was widespread in Europe and America. The United States administered its last smallpox vaccine in 1972. The last naturally occurring case of smallpox was in Somalia in 1977, and the World Health Organization declared the world smallpox free in 1980. That's why. The eradication of a once worldwide highly contagious and deadly disease has dropped smallpox off the radar screen in the last 30 years. However, due to the threat of biological warfare and bioterrorism, most countries, and in our case most states, including Massachusetts, have smallpox vaccines ready in a voluntary program aimed at healthcare workers. The idea is that if there was a bioterrorism outbreak of smallpox, the healthcare workers caring for the sick would be immune to the disease. However, risks are still involved and the program is voluntary. Thank you for listening. that he was that, taking and stuff? Yeah. yeah. Like, and, and the, the mercury and yeah. things like that. Pills that they gave them when they were trying to recover, I guess. Was that, was that common across all the small packs vaccination at that time? Did it continue into the time that Cat Island was a hospital? Were they still doing mercury the same. and some of these other things? I don't know. I have not, I, I've seen no, no evidence that talks about the exact kind of th treatments that they were doing there. You know, that what Dr. Hall Jackson's sort of um, preferential treatment was. My guess, I mean, it would be a guess only that they were. Um, that's not that far different, it's only about 10 years. And uh, John Adams had some money and the people in Cat Island had some money and those things costed money. If you were on the charity program, I don't know what would have happened. Yeah, because I do know that mercury was used even into the Civil War time and cause neurological disorders right. because There's probably it. problems that it created that really had nothing to do with, right, the original, the original problem, yeah. Well, it's kind of like if you survived that, yeah. you were gonna sort of survive anyway. Yeah. It's like only the hardy. Yeah, the, I mean, the evidence is that, for at least for Cat Island, is that the major overwhelming majority of people not only tolerated the inoculation, but it tolerated the effects, the effects of it, and uh, developed such small uh, cases of smallpox that weren't even pocked by it. Uh, that was mentioned, um, yeah. and it was, it was definitely, I mean, from a medical standpoint, it was success, no question. 
um, very small. I can't even think if, there, if they even talked about... Um, there was one gentleman, for instance, who went out there and they were having some sort of uh, exercise or I don't exactly know what they were doing, but he managed to blow his arm off with a cannon. And he not only survived the inoculation and was also cared for on the island with no arm and the, ho the open wound, he was fine and he came back and, and lived and they made a point about that. Ashley Bowen, I think, said something, you know, and he's, he doesn't even require a surgeon anymore, he said. So, I mean, obviously they're doing pretty good work out there. And what about Jeremiah Lee's family? Did any of them, do we know? I don't know, good we question. We know, actually. Yeah. Um, our curator, Karen McGinnis, just uh, mentioned to me um, what, when what, um, Mara was talking, that both Martha and Jeremiah Lee were inoculated. We know that from the Ashley Bowen journals. Yeah, know, were they on the island or were they somewhere else? Um, mm. That I don't know if it's... Uh, because there was that group that, that inoculated, that got themselves inoculated earlier in 17, you know, 30 and whatever, and went into Boston and did it. I mean, there were those people. Um, and, and again, remember, a lot of the people that were on Cat Island were Marbleheaders. They were coming to the island from other places. These four proprietors from Marblehead, the two Glovers, mm -hmm. Aza, Orn, mm -hmm. and Gary, mm -hmm. obviously, I think, were in it for the money. If they were charging that much, mm -hmm. And they were bringing wealthy folk in from all around New England. Mm. Yeah, why, I mean, why would why would they have done that at that particular time when revolution was by 1773? You know, certainly it was happening. Boring. Yeah, it was. It was. Boiling. Yeah, I mean the only thing I would agree they did it for the money, except that they originally tried to make it not a private enterprise. They said, "Let's own it by the town." And that was their idea. The town said, no, nope. and you could do it as your own thing. But, you know, and they, so they bought the island from a guy who owned it in Salem and did it on their own. I, I mean, I think, I think they felt that they were trying to do something good for the town, and they had already been leaders in some other areas. Um, but I, I mean, I, I put it down to the fear of smallpox was like, it was, it was so rampant that I think that they really, they really believed in inoculation. They really thought it would save them. I don't know. Ideas? Do you have a question? A comment? No, I mean, the only other thing, I mean, they had a huge capital investment in terms of building the hospital yeah. and, and that kind of stuff. 2,000 so pounds. I mean, uh, 2,000 pounds is a yeah, lot now. So, so maybe, I mean, part of the higher fee might have been just a... Just to kind of, they yeah. had to buy the island. Yeah. 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 But obviously that's going to make it out of reach for certain people. And yeah. I don't think yeah, that I mean, that ever right, really, right. I don't think that ever really bothered right. them. I don't think that that was something that they didn't, they, ex yeah. they accepted that. So, That's part so of it. was there a groundswell of some people who were poor really wanting to get inoculated, or is that hard no, to detect? No, I don't think so. No? no, the poor people really feared it. Right. They really feared it. I understand. So You're going to put some a smallpox in, right? yeah. thing into my arm? Right. Right. They didn't. They weren't privy to a lot of that information. They right. weren't reading the letters of Boylston and, and Mather. So no, it was definitely a class divide, right. um, and the education of the lower classes wasn't happening. It was sort of like, well, there's this hospital out there. Right. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about your research? Uh, I mean, uh, from this story you just told us, how you <coughs> sort of run down what you use. I mean, I'll tell you, one stuff. of the best things for the smallpox is Essex Gazette. I mean, that really, I read the entire Essex Gazette, every single one, and wow. my eyes still hurt from it because yeah. it's on <laughs> microfilm. Yeah. So it's like, oh. Uh, and uh, I read the whole thing, and it's fascinating. And there's, of course, tons of information that had nothing to do with Marblehead, but every time there was something about Marblehead, you know, I zoned in and I printed it. Yeah. And uh, they chronicle this pretty well. That and Ashley Bowen, those two sources are fantastic. He was obsessed with castle pox. He, he had, I mean, I only mentioned a little bit in here. I could have gone on and on about the things that he said. Um, he's the one that talks about, you know, what they're doing out there and, you know, how many times. He was obsessed with the ship, the Mercury. When the Mercury was here, when it was out, he would always remark where the Mercury was. Is it docked out by the island? Is it docked here? Is it in route? Where is it? He wanted to know where those people were at all times. The strength of the anti-inoculation fervor here in Marblehead was, were there other towns around the area that had, maybe not quite as extreme, but similar? Not as extreme, yeah, no. I mean, well, there may yeah. have been some, nothing like this. So this is really it Totally stands out. It. But it's not unusual if you know Marblehead. Yeah. <laughs> Marblehead, <laughs> they were like, I mean, that's, that's sort of why this fits in so well with sort of what I wrote in my book, was that they were a bunch of rogues. They were. And they, towards the, as the town began to boom between 1720 on, basically before, until after the revolution, um, you had a very nice gentrified level of, of the Jeremiah Lees, okay? 
but underneath that's still the minority. Underneath it, there's still it's still a, a rough and tumble group. They weren't particularly religious if you compare them with the Salem people. Um, they rejected a lot of what Salem had done early on. Uh, they had all kinds of squabbles with the churches, and there's all kinds of church politics wrapped up into those inoculation riots. Um, it's not that surprising knowing them. It is. But they're different. I mean, there's no question about it. They're different. That's why when somebody, when a scholar comes around and wants to write about um, this guy, Andrew, he wanted to write specifically about um, sort of uh, problems with medicine, advances, but where it really where it hit the wall with the, with the public opinion. And of course, Marblehead's his example. That's why he comes here and does the research here, because we've got some serious issues. You know, um, it wasn't, it really wasn't like that. Even, even in Boston, Boston took inoculation on pretty quickly. I can't speak for Europe because I haven't really done a lot of, of, of look of, in, you know, uh, in-depth research into how inoculation spread in Europe, other than I know that it was high-profile people that were sort of paraded out doing it, but I don't know exactly if there were any sort of riots or anything. There may have been. Hmm. What's the difference between inoculation and vaccination? Inoculation is when you're giving yourself the actual disease, but, you're, but by doing that, you're giving yourself a lower version of it, like a lesser, you know, uh, strong strain, so that you then have it. Go through the, you go through having smallpox. It lasts less. Um, it is less strong. You, you may not actually be scarred from it, and most of the time, you'll live through it. And then you're immune after that. Vaccination is, they, vac they actually inject cowpox into you you then contract cowpox, which is a much lesser problem and wouldn't have killed you anyway. That, the antibodies that your body makes, is also going to keep you from getting smallpox. So the vaccination is done with a needle mm -hmm. and the inoculation is just rubbed onto a wound? Uh, no, uh, inoculation rough is, inoc they, did, they did eventually have inoculations with needles. Um, they basically wouldn't take, take some smallpox cells into a needle and do it. Because they talk about needles a lot. The, uh, um, the Turkish uh, doctor had, was using uh, very, very small needles. He was, he was saying, look, if you come to me, you'll hardly even feel this. Whereas the, what they showed you, for instance, on that John Adams thing was really quite graphic, right? They basically sliced an, her arm and put smallpox in it. That was, um, that was HBO. You know? <laughs> so how is it actually transmitted smallpox? Well, they, high, you mean like how contagious? I think it, touch. Um, so I'm, it's yeah, contact. yeah, contact. Um, so if you're in contact with someone with just when the pustules are breaking out, just when they're starting to get them, you're going to get it. If, if they're already scabbed over and they're, and they're starting to fall off, most likely not, but they did not know that for a long time. I don't know. I don't actually know if it was officially clothing. I just think that it's not. It's not. I'm not that surprised that someone might have thought that. I don't know if you could, if it lasted on clothes, how long it lasted. Um, but they felt like it would. And in fact, and in fact, at the end of the day, as I said, the clothes that, that came back were actually probably already fumigated, and the ones that had been burnt were definitely fumigated, right? They'd been burned. So it wasn't that anyone was really at, in ri at risk. It's just they felt they were. Plus, the Marbleheaders did not like you doing anything without their say. They didn't want, you know, oh, you're going to build an island, you know, a, a hospital on an island, even though they had rejected owning it themselves. It didn't, it does not go down well, you know, and you're, you're landing somewhere you're not supposed to land. You're putting us all at, at risk. It's just their way of dealing with it. It's not that no other town ever felt these things, but they didn't, uh, they didn't burn down hospitals and stuff. I'm curious, when um, ships were coming in from overseas that, that had smallpox on them, was there any effort to quarantine? Yes, they quarantined them on this island, Rainsford Island, outside Boston Harbor, um, and then they smoked them. They smoked them with sulfur smoke as much as they could, and they literally put people on there to rub vinegar all over them. Ashley Bowen did that for a while. Um, that's what they did. So they had a quarantine island, and then, even after the quarantine island, then they still smoked them and rubbed them with vinegar. They're, I mean, they were definitely getting it by ship. That's, I mean, that was one of the ways smallpox was most easily transmitted. The role of smallpox in the, in the uh, European uh, thrust into North America was gigantic. Right. Just rampage through the native. Right. They, think, they think 90%. Yeah. I mean, the, the scholars I've heard, they, they think we've underestimated the death toll. It's more like 90% of the uh, indigenous of South and Central died. Less than 90% of North, but close. 
you know, a high percentage, 60, 65, something like that. It's huge, huge numbers. Yeah, and I, I once saw a documentary on TV, and I was always wondering why they, they succumb so quickly and not other. And they said over the thousands of years, hundreds of years in mm -hmm. Europe, there had been very many different kinds of plagues, which mm -hmm. gave them some base immunity. Absolutely. The Europeans. They had more immunity. They, they could still get it, but they had yeah. more. It's, that's exactly what it was. They had more immunity, so they were going to. As the time went on, you have less people in the pool that can actually contract it, and less, and less, and less, and less. And when they came to the Incas, there wasn't one person that had ever had any antibody against the smallpox, so it just wiped them out. It's kind of like um, the Black Death. You know, there are this wonderful science now that we have that tells us that people who had the Black Death actually had the plague, but didn't die of it. Okay, there's not that many of those people, but the people who did that survived the, pl the plague. Their ancestors are now today immune from AIDS, immune from HIV virus. A ding dong, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not a doctor. I don't. I'm not even a historian of medicine. I just, I just know that. I know that yeah, because we've studied. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Absolutely. But you have to have had it, and your body has to have survived it in order for that to be the case. You can't have had a a relative who back in the day died of the plague. That does not give you the immunity. The immunity has you have to have survived it. You're going to have to fight it out. Mm -hmm. I, I know the Rainford Island is uh, used for mm. quarantine. Mm -hmm. And in subsequent years, so was the <coughs> Island, mm. so was Deer Island during the Irish immigration. Mm -hmm. do, do you have any idea what the period of quarantine might have been? Was it two weeks, three weeks, a month? I, I feel like it was at least 30 days because that's how long they wanted to keep the people on the island. 30 days. Yeah. I I would was, if they didn't show that they had evidence of the disease during that period, it was a safe bet a reasonably safe bet that they could go ashore. I guess so. The, the part of the, the anger of the Marbleheaders was that they knew that these people were coming back before 30 days. They, they were counting. Ashley Bowen was counting. And they knew that you know, they, this was 23 days. And that's why that, that, that one patient got his house. He wasn't there, but he got his house sort of surrounded um, because he had, he had organized for him to leave early. And they, you know, you do, why are you leaving early? You, know, you need to do the whole thing. I mean, I kind of understand that, quite frankly. Two questions um, pop into mind. If the Marble Headers were so upset with the four proprietors, yeah. why did they rally around John Glover? That's one question. Yeah. Second question, how many loyalists, folks with money, were getting inoculated on Cat Island? Yeah, sure. Glover turned out to be this, all four of them turned out to be these great patriots. Mm -hmm. So, no. you know, it was forgiven. Obviously. It was forgiven. I mean, the, the revolution blew all of this out. I, that's what I mean by it. It changes your perspective. I mean, I think that they, they inoculation and smallpox became a minor. Marblehead was hit incredibly hard by the revolution. They sent 40% of their people out. They had so many widows and, and, and orphans that that's what the town literally became known for for the next 50 years. You know, that's what it was known as the place of wi widows and orphans. Um, some of that was from the fishermen in the sea, and some of that was from the revolution. I think that yeah, I think that they got overwhelmed by a bigger issue. Now, I know, for instance, that one, I'm trying to think of who it is now, I'm not going to come up with the name, one of the men who was involved in some of this bad doing that was very much um, punished in some way for either, I'm trying to remember if it was the first riot or the, or the burning, um, was then in John Glover's regiment. He worked, he, he was, you know. So... It's a good question. I think, I think that, yeah, I think that the revolution, you're, now we're at war. And it helped, of course, that everybody who hadn't been inoculated before, if you go into the Continental Army, now you're inoculated. So it's like, no choice. You're doing it. And then when you don't die of smallpox, you think, oh. And then when you come back from the war, you have your families inoculated. It's like, you know, step by step, we, we somehow realize. Um, but you've got to remember, people are so afraid of getting other things, too. We were deathly afraid of syphilis. Which, if I showed you a picture of that, that's really bad. I mean, talk about great pox. I mean, these people had these huge things on their faces. Um, so, question. Okay, since you mentioned syphilis, did Marvel have a history of reacting unusually to other diseases as well? I don't, I don't have anything on that. Not really. All right. This is not a question, but John Glover was so upset with the reaction of the townsfolk in burning that uh, hospital, 
Uh, he had been a member of the co uh, Committee of Correspondence. Right. And he withdrew from that. Right. And uh, for a while, he refused to participate in any effort towards uh, preparing for the, uh, the revolution. Mm -hmm. We didn't know it was going to come to that. But, mm -hmm. uh, it was only by, I forget how long it took him to finally uh, realize that his effort was really needed yeah. and he rejoined the group. But there was a period there where yeah. he refused to have anything to do. And Gary too, he resigned as well. They were both very put off by this whole thing. And I know, for instance, that his brother, Jonathan, was so worried about his own house being kind of taken down by a mob that he had a, a cannon. <laughs> At the window, the train down on the road. So if they if they st if they decided to to mob out there, he'd set off his cannon. They, he was paranoid. They were very scared about it. I would be too, frankly. Oh, I have yeah. a question because you mentioned cowpox. Now, my understanding of cowpox is that they figured out that milkmaids weren't getting smallpox, and but yet they had this other thing that they got from milking the cows that was, I guess, fairly minor. Mostly on the hands, and yes. they didn't die of it, yeah. And so that it's like chicken pox, you know, you get it, but it's not gonna kill you. So that really is how... Yeah, Edward Jenner was working on things very much sort of unrelated to this, and then uh, ended up, he was out in Gloucestershire, and he, he was working with milkmaids who had cow pox on their hands, and uh, made the connection uh, that if you got cow pox, and then you were immune to not only cow pox, but smallpox too. And that's how we went. And of course, at, at first, everyone was like, no, 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 no. And then eventually he, he you know, convinced people and they started doing it. Um, but this is the first state to ever do it here in this, on this country. I'm sure it's Boston, yeah. <laughs> but as, as early as the time of the American Revolution, they were inoculating the troops. They were inoculating, they, uh, not vaccinating, inoculating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not vaccinating. Vaccinating, uh, Edward Jenner is doing that yeah. uh, later on. Later I, I think on. the first vaccinations but, are in the so 19th century. Then it became widespread. Yeah, with then it replaces pump. inoculation. It re vaccination replaces inoculation by uh, 1840, completely. No one's inoculating anymore because inoculation really gives you the disease. It really gives you smallpox. So you could, you know, there's that 2%. And even if you didn't die, you could be really disfigured, possibly. Yeah. Um, so there's always that risk and you can catch something else. Vaccination with cowpox is a much lesser problem. And even, even if you contracted cowpox, you contracted such a small version of it that it, wasn't, it was, became a negligible issue. It's really amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. I get, I get every vaccine known to man. <laughs> they offer it, I'm like, Let's do it, come on. I just believe in it, I mean, look at this, you know? It's, but it only works if people, everybody does it. <laughs> kinda, you know, you kinda all gotta do it. Well, Lauren, thank you very much. Thank you.